So, all right. Well, great worship. Thank you, guys, all of you girls. That was wonderful. Wonderful. You know, I, <clears throat> my mind runs on two tracks, my soul and my spirit, too, the whole time. Worship, but that's wonderful. Then in the middle of that, I'm hearing a song, uh, maybe not as worshipful, but it's really a great word because I can feel it coming in the air tonight. I've been waiting for this moment all my life, and we're at a crossroads. We're at a place that I've been waiting for all my life, honestly. And I, I, am, I am as excited as you can get um, in this time, in this season. Um, at any rate, um, I want you to uh, look at a piece of Scripture out of the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and uh, uh, verse 7, uh, reading from the NAS, or maybe the Amplified. Not sure, but uh, as you're turning there, I, I just want to say yeah, this is this is this is an amazing season, it's an amazing time. Signs of the times are everywhere, and I'm starting to get a little bit excited. And uh, but I had uh, an encounter with the Lord 37 years ago, and um, in this 37 year ago encounter, um, <clears throat> the Lord visited me about some things and talked to me about some things, and I promised Him then, and uh, that I would never let two years go by without bringing this to the people of God again and encouraging them, because it was um, a generational uh, word, and uh, he spoke very personally about it. So since I've been here, I probably shared from this context uh, of the book of Hebrews uh, four or five times, and um, I thought, oh, not again, Lord, but then I thought, wait a minute, now again, because this is a major time. This is a time to say things that the Lord promised me that I see starting to develop and come to pass. We're at a tipping point like we've never been. We're at an a earth-shaking, a radical shift like we have never seen before. And all the things we've hoped for and promised is right at our fingertips right now. We're going to see the worst of the worst and the best of the best, but the best of the best is going to so overshadow the worst of the worst that we're going to say, Lord, Thank you. Wonderful. Jesus did both. He had the worst of the worst. They nailed him to the cross, but the best of the best came out of that. And so uh, let me just read you again this uh, um, uh, NAS uh, portion of Scripture out of the book of Hebrews. And by faith, Noah, being warned by God of things not yet seen. Are you there? In reverence, he prepared an ark for the salvation of his house, whole, which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is according um, to faith. I like the Amplified, too, that says, Promoted by faith, Noah being forewarned of God concerning events of which as yet was not visible, signed that he took heed and he diligently constructed and prepared an ark for the deliverance of his own family. But by this, by faith, which he relied on God, he passed judgments and sentence on the world, unbelief, and became an heir and possessor of righteousness and right standing with God. I think we're living in that spot. And I want to say something absolutely crazy, but at my age, I can say crazy stuff and people don't, that they don't care. But I am Noah, in a sense. We all have different things that we identify with and different things the Lord has spoken to us about. There are three or four things in my life the Lord has called me. I'm an Aaron in one way, I'm a Joseph in another, but I'm also a Noah. And I want to talk to you from that context of 37 years ago. And uh, I think we're just three years away from me from my visitation from the Lord about Noah. I think that we're only three years away from that 40-year mark. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days. 40 is a big number. We're coming up, for me, I'm coming up, coming up on a 40th time uh, scale uh, that began in 1987 with me in a visitation about what is about to happen in 40 years. I'm three years away. I didn't believe I'd make it here, but I'm three years away from seeing what the Lord showed me in 1987, and I want to talk to you about it. I don't know how good it's going to be or how bad it's going to be. And the Lord said to me back then, sometimes you appreciate with great enthusiasm and be articulate. Other times you're going to stumble around. I don't ask you. I have not told you how well to preach it. I just told you to be faithful to preach it. Faithfulness trumps being cool. So anyway, 
So with, with that in mind, let me tell you what uh, happened to me in 1987 and how that is relevant to today and talk to you about that. And especially in light of what uh, is happening right now on the earth, and we'll pull those threads together in a minute. 1987, I had, I had uh, landed in uh, California, moving from um, uh, Arkansas. I was 37 years old, took my family there because an angel of the Lord visited me in the middle of the night in Arkansas, never been, never been further than the Arkansas state line, going west or east or north or south. But I was pretty much stuck. Uh, but, but anyway, so I, I, I had a visitation, and an angel of the Lord took me up in the spirit, took me over the United States, and he showed me the Southern California coastline, which I'd never seen from that distance, never seen it at all, actually, and said and pointed to that direction, said, this is where the Lord wants you obey God and live, disobey God, and you will die here. And so within two years, a year and a half or so, I had made it, against impossible odds, and everybody thought it was crazy. I pastored in a small church thing called Fountain of Life. I think they named it Fountain of Death after that. But, but I, le- I, I gave it to my associate, and uh, I left, and uh, I made it to California. It was a crazy thing. I, I wound up in a place called Saugus Newhall, Valencia area, which is north of L.A. and um, <clears throat> in, the, in the high desert. So it's 1987. I'm there. I'm going, Lord, what am I here for? What's going on? And, um, and so I have a visitation, uh, probably the one of the top, uh, top three or four in my lifetime. I recently had another one just a week ago. I have a, not talking about that one, the top three or four of my lifetime. And I'm saying, wow, these things are, these things are coming together for, for me and you, for us. And I know some stuff. I really know some stuff. But I dare not say it because I probably interpreted it wrong. So I've got to give it a little time. Uh, but, but at any rate, uh, so I'm there, and I don't know, what, I don't know why I'm, what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing there at all. But here's what I do know, and this is, uh, sounds out of context, but I'll bring it to context in a second. Since a little boy, I've loved rain. Since a little boy, I've loved rain. My favorite thing as a little boy in Arkansas would be to go outside when it's raining and stand in the rain and just put my hands up and let it hit me in the face as long as it could rain because my grandfather had told me that when it rains, it is heaven weeping on me. And I love it, and I could feel that, and I felt that as a little boy. And he talked to me about Noah, and I felt like Noah as a little boy, like a little Noah. And I loved the rain. Anytime it rained, you could find me by the creek, or you could find me uh, just standing in a mud puddle, or my parents screaming at me, get out, are you stupid? You know, no, I'm Noah. Anyway, so that has been with me all my life. And I'd never understood what that was all about until 1987. So it's 1987. I've only been there a couple of weeks. I'm, I'm lying down in the bedroom of a, of, of a family that I knew that had moved there. And uh, they took me and uh, my family in for a while to stay. And it was somewhere around midnight on, um, in that month. I don't remember what month it was. But as it was, uh, uh, I... Uh, I uh, trying to get the, trying to get the details in order here. I woke up, and I'm trying to figure out how to say this, and so I sound weird, or you think I'm over saying. I'm going to understate it. But I woke up in the Lord in person. It's happened to me a number of times. I was standing at the foot of my bed. I could see couldn't see his face. It was cloud with a cloud of glory, and he preached a message to me. I don't know if you ever had that, but that's once in a lifetime when Jesus comes to preach a message to you. And he preached to me out, <clears throat> and he preached to me, um, out of Matthew 24 and 37. And he said audibly in the room, he said to me, <clears throat> as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And he began to preach to me about an unprecedented flood of his spirit that he was going to release upon the earth. And he called me Noah. And he said, you are Noah to your generation. I want you to be faithful uh, in your lifetime to build faith and to alert and to, and to talk to the body of Christ and to live like Noah and prepare your ark for something that is coming that is unprecedented that no one 
would ever conceive could happen, where the waters and the glory of the Lord would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. It was just amazing. And I thought, wow, I could smell rain, I could feel rain, and it began to rain in the room. And as it's raining, literally in the room, I, would, I ran to the window and look out, and it, outside it's not raining. It's raining on me. And the Lord continued to tell me, he said, it's going to begin as a small drizzle. And in seven years, you will see the first of the small outpourings. And that's only the beginning. That would have put it into 1993, uh, uh, 94, which happened in Toronto as a part of the first part of that, and which I didn't realize until the time came. That was what he meant by I would see the first droplet, so the first, the dew before the morning, before the rain comes. He said, but don't, don't, don't be fooled in thinking that or even the next move of God. The next one is a major thing. This is a precursor. This is a sprinkling before a major flood comes in your lifetime, in your, your generation. And he began to talk to me and prophesied that. He said, I will send a flood of my spirit on the earth, and the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And he began to talk to me about how that small rain is refreshing but floods are devastating. And they change the landscape. They change everything that can be changed. And they reshape the dirt. They reshape rivers. They reshape rivers. He said, you are going to experience in your lifetime as a Noah. If you'll be faithful, no one will listen. There'll be scoffers probably. And there'll be people who did not listen as Noah's day. But you have one thing. You have to say it. And you have to prepare the ark. And you have to warn the people that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when I come back in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And, uh, wow, you know, that was, like, um, interesting. And he talked to me about a 40-year period. And, by the way, from 1937, we are three years away from a 40-year period in my life. And as long as I've been doing this uh, and uh, living in this God zone since a little boy, uh, I've been... Excited now and then, but I have never felt so confident and so sure and so right. I have it right that I know 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 that something unprecedented, something earth shaking, something that the earth has never seen before, something absolutely wonderful where the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of the Lord and His Christ, where God is going to make a move on planet earth like He did with Noah, and He's going to raise the ark and the house of God above all the high mountains and the hills and the earth, and it's going to rain. I thought, again, 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was in the wilderness 40 uh, uh, days and nights. Israel was in the wilderness 40 years. There's a 40 dynamic that is about to happen. And we're three years away, in my context, from that 40. And I don't know about you, but I think it's about time. Like, I am really tired. I mean, this morning, I said, Lord, are you kidding me? You want me to do this again? I promise. I got a migraine. I've had it for two days. And he said, that's your grain, not my grain. You go ahead and do it. So here we are at this place. And so I want to say this again, because you've heard it before, if you've been around me at any length of time, that anything worth saying, anything worth receiving from God is worth repeating. The preacher or a minister or a teacher who doesn't repeat himself has very little conviction of the value of what he's saying, what he's knowing. Jesus said, and I say to you again. Uh, we live in a world where every message had to be new and tickling and fun. It's like, no, it's repetitive. The Lord over and over and over again promised Israel and over and over and over again spoke to Noah and Noah spoke and preached. For 40 years, something was coming that the earth had never seen before because he had never rained on the earth at that time. There was only dew in the morning and a little dew at night. We've had a lot of dew drop Christianity. It's been wonderful. It's fun, but it's not as wet as it needs to be. But there is something way beyond a little dew in the morning, a little dew at night. There is an outpouring from heaven. There is a deluge that is coming. There is something so incredibly, wonderfully blinding. And this is what the Lord said to me at the end of it, the 40 years, when you'll go through, he said, you will see in seven years, which was, again, the Toronto uh, the renewal that began there. You will see in seven years, he talked to me about how that would happen, how the Assembly of God Church would be affected by that, which was uh, Pensacola. And, and seven years before it happened, I knew and that I would be a part of that. 
And, but he said, do not be mistaken and think this is the thing. And it's, this is, he said, this is a precursor before the storm. And he talked to me about storms. He said the most dangerous and the most dramatic uh, uh, part of a storm is, is the backside. I mean, when floods come in, it's the backside of the storm. Man, that, that is when the floods rise. That's when things really happen. The beginning of a storm, the beginning of an outpouring, the beginning of a flood is right. But, boy. Uh, when you're in a tornado or a flood, it is that it is that backdraft, it is that back wall. And he said, "You will see the back wall of the storm, and it will devastate every creepy crawling thing in the earth, and lift the house of God above all things in the earth." And I, you may think I'm nuts, but I'm crazy for such a reason. I live and I'm on this earth. I am Noah in this generation. I've always known it. I feel it. I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. I'm trying, just saying I'm 73. I know I'm not stupid. I'm not going to be here at 103 or 93 or 83. But I'm here for a reason, and I feel the pieces coming together, and I know that 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 I can say that we're about to experience a global shift and a global flood within the next three years that is going to change everything we've ever known about, everything about everything about everything about everything about everything. It's a major, major shift. And the glory of God, say it again, will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That kind of does it with the negative stuff. And no, they'll be negative because, listen, storms always have a negative side. And boy, that negative side can be destructive, uh, as you well know. So, let me talk to you about five things that are relevant to accommodate what God is about to do. Very simple, but I take them from the book of Noah in Genesis chapter 6. I'm not going to read you through that. I thought the 6 and 7 is the two chapters on the coming flood in Noah's day. And I thought numerically how 6 is the number of man and 7 is the number of God. There's a man-God thing that's about to happen, as it did then. That's going to be absolutely um, unprecedented. Uh, wow, my heart is racing. I mean, this is, this, is a big, this is the most important thing in my life. And uh, I've grown weary of saying it. But I am, have the faith to see it. And I believe I'm going to see it. Since I've lived in Nashville, since I've been here in Nashville twice, I've awakened with a vision in the middle of the night, and I'm preaching like this. One before I even came here in a small church like this, and while I'm preaching, it starts raining inside the building. And the rain is so loud, people are screaming. They don't know what to do. It is the Lord pouring his spirit out on this nation, on this globe, on the earth, on the church, on his people. And he's, listen, to those that are in the low ground, it's going to be death to death. To those that are in the ark, which is Christ, it's going to be life and life extravagantly wonderful. We're going to be lifted. And so I've seen that twice. I've felt that twice since I've been here. But let me talk about five things we must do to accommodate the next uh, phase of what I believe is a coming flood. And by the way, isn't it interesting to me, I thought this morning, wow, there's an eclipse tomorrow. That's a sign of things in the heavens. In addition, it's going to rain like heck, too. I go, you're pretty good, Lord. That's pretty good. You get an eclipse and rain. I kind of like that. I, I think that is wonderful. That fits the narrative for me. Uh, first, I think there's a need for change. And the Lord is forcing change upon us in this time. So, First, I must say, rec we, we need to recognize our need and our dehydration spiritually and who and what we are, where we have been, not condemning ourselves, but recognize that a proper diagnosis is the only way you get a real-time cure. We have been wrongly diagnosing where we're at, and we need to be really honest about where we're at. It wasn't until Adam and Eve recognized their sin that God provided covering from. Stop trying to put new wine in old wine skins. Recognize we are spiritually hydrated or dehydrated, and we need a divine infusion of God from heaven that will radically bring health to us in a way that we have never known or understood before. So I guess we should say, or I should say, we just need to re not, not so much repent or wallow in some kind of self-pity, but we need to recognize our shortcomings. We need to recognize 
I would say, we need to recognize this generation has never seen rain before like Noah had never seen rain before. He didn't know how to describe it. He didn't know what it felt like. There had never rained on the earth before in Noah's day, and Noah was told by God it's going to rain. It's like, what does that mean? So what I'm trying to tell you is something there's no explanation for. I don't know how to say what this spiritual rain is going to look like other than it's going to be so completely different than anything we've ever known before. It's not going to be just a little dew, a little here, a little moisture, a little there, a little drop, a little condensation in the morning. It, the floodgates of heaven are going to open, and there's going to be a shaking in the heaven, and there's going to be a storm and an outpouring from the river of God that flows from his throne that is going to be extraordinarily way beyond the comprehension of anything we've ever thought or lived for or believed, and it is going to be absolutely amazingly close to the time we're living in. I should be at another church. I don't know. But uh, the ark, the church, let's say that, but, but I could get into the, but the, I used to do teachings on the ark all about the wood. It's made out of cedar, how it was wood in the three level, how it is the body of Christ and what the ark is and how it had a hole in the top looking under Jesus, the author of our finish of our faith, the dove, the Holy Spirit was sent out. The whole, I mean, the ark speaks of the life in Christ and who we are in, in Christ and the church of Jesus Christ, the global church of Jesus Christ. And uh, that ark, and here's what the scripture says, is Christ. And we are in him as we're in that ark. He is the ark. And God sent from him the dove of the Holy Spirit to us three times, and it didn't return. The last time it did not return with the book of Acts, and it's been on us for 2,000 years, but something even greater is going to happen than that. I thought it was, I'm ahead of myself, but I thought it was interesting when it rained in Noah's day, it said this, it, ev it killed every creeping, crawling thing in the earth. I don't know about you, but I'm done with creepy, crawly stuff. I am so done with creep in my own life and what I see, I'm done with that, but what God is about to do is just radically so in time, done, pull it all together, yay God, We've waited for this moment all of our lives. The church has waited for it for thousands and thousands of years. So we must recognize, again, I think we need to recognize that we are spiritually dehydrated. At least I am in a lot of ways. I don't have enough of that living water. Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. What we've had is dewdrop drop Christianity to some degree, as Noah had. We, and, and preach how you may. Write it how you may, but it's not going to be what you think because you've never seen it before. Noah just knew it was going to rain, but he didn't know what it looked like. He didn't know what it felt like he didn't know until it came. So I just want to admonish you, don't preconceive what you think this thing's going to look like. Just let it happen. Let it happen. And, do, and, and not only let it happen, you have to do number two. You have to, here's why you let it happen. If you're going to see this, if you're going to be a part of this, and we are going to be a part of this, then number two, you must, and this happened in Genesis 6, 14 through uh, 16, you, we must make proper preparations for what is coming. What does that mean? What did Noah do? Noah built his ark. How do I translate that into a Christian or into a spiritual context? Who is our ark? Christ is our ark. We are safe in the ark. He is that ark. So we are to, as, as preparations were made, Noah built the ark. We're built up into Christ as one body in him. There is a building up. There is a preparation uh, uh, of the ark. Uh, it was said, uh, Hebrews eleven seven by faith, Noah prepared. By faith, Noah prepared an ark for the, ooh, get this, for the saving of his whole household. You can stop beating your relatives over the head with the Bible on this one. He had built an ark. If we will be obedient to build ark, to build up Christ, to get into Christ, to understand what it means to be in Christ, when this thing comes, our whole family will be saved, will be ushered in the ark. Every animal, you know, of every species will, that come to the ark, that smell the water, will be able to be facilitated in this outpouring of the Spirit of God. It is by far, in my, in my humble little opinion, 
probably the greatest event and, and since the book of Genesis. It's going to be amazing. And we're sitting at the very precipice, at the very edge of a global millennial shift. And we're flying blind. Are we distracted? Are we into our own stuff? Or we can't get over? Or we can't? What, it's like, my gosh, we need to start preparing for that. Because like Noah, let me put it this way. The depth of the revival or the depth of the move of God that's coming will be in direct proportion to the depth of the preparation you put into it. You will only contain or retain as much water as you dig a hole for. We need to start, we need to start getting our buckets out. We need to start digging deep. We need to start building uh, this ark. So the question is not is it going to rain. The question is how much can you facilitate? How much space have you cleared out in your life to facilitate something you've never seen before, something you've never experienced before? How much stuff can you throw away that's good, but it's yesterday's theology, it's old wine, because you don't put new wine in old happenings like this. How much of it can you clear out of all your religious head and all of your stuff and say, I am open, Lord, do something new, do what Isaiah said he would do. Behold, in the last days, I shall do a new thing, and suddenly it's going to spring forth. Shall you not know it? Well, we will know it if we prepare for it. So Noah humbled himself, by the way, humbled himself and built and built and built and prepared in the face of mockery to those who said, we've never seen anything like this. We've never heard of anything like this, and you're an idiot. What are you doing? You should be out doing this. No, he's building an ark. It is time to prepare our spirits, our soul, our hearts, our own personal ark, the ark of our family, ark is Christ. It is time to lean into that. Number three, we must make room. This is going to be a tough one maybe, not for anyone here, but for some people, honestly. We must make room for every person. We must make room for every person, for those, no matter who they are, that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're about to hit an evangelistic space that this world has never seen. It will far surpass 2,000 years ago Christianity and the New Testament as far as global impact and peoples that are brought in. So we must, that's Genesis 6:19. Not only you and your whole family, but get this. God said, and I will cause every creature of every species everywhere on the earth to find their way into the ark. There will be a cross-pollination of species of every humanity. God is about to welcome those who will into this ark. And we're going to ride the crest of one of the greatest moves of God for 40 days and nights, as, or longer than forever, as Noah did. Uh, and while the earth is being devastated, the ark and all those that are in the ark are going to be lifted up one of the highest glories that we've ever imagined as planet earth. And when that settles down, and when the waters evade and settles down, Noah walks out with all the animals, and he says, and he walks out into a new heaven, and a new earth. We are a chosen generation of generations of generation that has the possibility, I won't see it, but the younger ones will see it, to live in a world where for the first time in millennia that we're living in a new heavens and a new earth on this planet. And that every nation, every culture, every species, every person will have an opportunity, male and female, by it says they came into the ark. They had a sense something was coming, and they made their way into the kingdom of God. And, wow, it was just 11, 11, 11, just changed 11, 11, 15. Love that. That was, that was a prophetic moment there. But anyway, so I think that, I think, I know. I know that what we have, what we have talked about and made seminars about and written books about and have uh, gotten arguments about and have theologized about and, and have built religious uh, institutions about 
and have built schools about, and all the stuff, that's good, all the preparation, all the right. I think all that's now going to become a living reality. All that was prep work for the real. That's about something real that we've been talking about is at our doorstep. You may probably won't say it, I won't, but my, but my children will and my grandchildren will. A new heaven and a new earth. Number four. Genesis 6 or 7-11, like that. There was a 7-11 even back there. So, Genesis 4, <laughs> I mean, point four. We must believe God for an abundance of rain. Not just a little, and this is redoing a little bit, that because I've said it before, I'll say it again. I got ahead of myself. It had never rained before. What you're about to experience looks like no revival. You're, stop trying to relive past revival. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. I'm so done with that. I, 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 I appreciate that, but it's set in a context of time and space that is yesterday. It's, I am done with the museum mentality. I'm done with going back and trying to resurrect the dead or trying to do what's already been done. I'm ready for the nursery where babies have never been seen before and where there's never been that life that's ever lived before. I, listen, I don't live in a museum mentality. I live in a nursery mentality. Museums are quiet and silent and are figurines that have no life but resemble things that used to live way back there. Nurseries are nasty, <laughs> smelly, and full of chaos but there's life there. I believe this next thing that God is doing is I'm talking about has nothing to do with resurrecting a past revival. I'm done with that. Why would I want to redo something somebody else has already did? There's just something in me since a boy that's cried out for authenticity to never be a copy. I refuse to be a copy. I am not a copy. You are not a copy. I am not supposed to do what someone else has done. God is creative enough to spread out authenticity among all of us that no one will have to ever have to repeat anything or anyone else anymore. What you have is unique to who you are and is in front of you, not behind you. I do not want, I love Azusa Street. I love the 16th century revival. I love the, the renewals. I love all that stuff. Why would I? I don't want to do that. That is a, that is a tomb mentality. I want a womb mentality. We're going from tomb to womb. I'm done with tomb revivals. A womb means all you know, there's a form of godliness there somewhere, and there's a shape and there's life, but you don't know what it looks like. You have no idea, and it's painful at the very end. None of us guys would know that, but we've had wives and daughters and grand, you know, so we, we know that it looks painful, especially when they say, get out of the room. But anyway, that's because we don't know what to do. But, 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 I, but, it, but it's like, oh, my gosh, we're going from, we, we have to get rid of our tomb mentality and embrace a womb mentality. We have to, we have to keep, we can't keep laying flowers at the grave of yesterday's move of God, hoping that somehow we're going to get a piece of Catherine Kuma's anointing. I don't want her. I want mine. I love her. She was right in her history, and all the other men and women of God were right in their space and time. But why would I want their anointing when mine is sitting there waiting for me and nothing like it has ever lived ever before or after in this universe as it is with you? You have something unique to this season of time that has nothing to do with a museum mentality about the things the way it used to look or the things the way it used to be. I don't want to redo the past. I want to recreate the future. Larry, I, I, I'm doing it for me. Okay. We must believe God for an abundance of rain. Never rained before. Like I said, just to do morning and night. But I want you to get this in Genesis 5 and 6. Get this. This is what the Lord said. By the way, when the Lord is standing there, I don't know if you ever had, that's an experience once in a lifetime where the Lord comes to preach you a sermon, to preach me. He preached. He was preaching. And I hate to say this. I hate it. I, I, you're going to get me. He sounded nearly Pentecostal. Because Scripture said, and he cried out with a loud voice. You remember that? So he really was like, 
Okay, at least I'm kind of partly there, but. Okay. It had never rained before. Just a vapor by morning, vapor by night. No context for what was about to happen. But here's what happened. Genesis says, and, the, and God, the fountains of the deep were broken up, and God shook the fountains of the deep. Out of your deep, what? He shook the fountains of the deep. He shook them, and he opened the floodgates of heaven. Jesus said, it, Jesus said the same thing I'm saying 2,000 years ago to a little woman, for out of your belly, the fountains of the deep shall flow the floodgates of heaven. He was 2,000 years ahead of her on that one. But I believe that. So here's what I, I, we need. I love faith. Of course, we need faith. But more than f we need flood faith. We don't need new preaching faith, new revelatory, new gifting faith, new this faith, new, new car faith, new new house. We need flood faith. By faith, Noah believed. Hebrews said, by faith, Noah believed for something he had never seen before, an unprecedented outpouring of the Spirit. All the other stuff in my life, at this point in my life, means nothing to me except that flood faith. And the Lord said to me way back there, when this happened, Larry, prepare your life. Have flood faith. Take all your faith and put it into one river for a flood of my spirit that will cover the earth and the fountains of the deep to be shaken and the floodgates of heaven. So, what am I living for? The sound, like Elijah heard, of the abundance of rain. The sound of the abundance of rain, a super anointing an abundance of spiritual outpouring that we have absolutely no context for. That's called a surprise. And as far as I'm concerned, I named him a long time ago Jehovah Surprise because that's what he's been to me. He's Jehovah Shalom, he's Jehovah Nissi. I understand that, but to me, it's Je Jehovah Serendipity. It's Je Jehovah Surprise. It's Jehovah Gotcha. It's Jehovah Gotcha most of the time. It's like, yeah, I didn't see that one coming. You know, that's how you know it's me. Because if you had it figured out, that's your theology. So nothing wrong with that. We, we can figure that out. But I'm saying the Lord seems to take the light into messing us up. Into, because, in, into, into, into knocking us off center of our theological grid and our, what we think or what we have already said, what people are saying. I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to stand out here. So I'm going to take this risk including me, especially me, and all other pro prophetic voices in the earth. And we love the prophetic. I, I don't know how to say this. What is coming? What is coming is hidden. I don't think anybody's going to get it. The way you're going to know it is nobody's going to get it. Because you know what's going to happen? There's going to be a sound. You know what the sound is going to be? It's not like, oh, I'll tell you what's coming. No, the sound is going to be Acts, and, Acts 2 in the upper room. What the heck is that? Not like, well, I prophesied that four years ago. No, what is that? This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. I mean, there is a sound. And this is the word, the key word. He is God suddenly. Jehovah suddenly. And suddenly. They were devastated. They had no context. They didn't know what was going on. And suddenly, in a moment of time, in a millisecond, everything changed for eternity. In a millisecond, a sound is heard from heaven. And by the way, oh, God, help me. Larry, I'm preaching to you, okay? So, God, it didn't say a sound was heard in the church. It didn't say a sound was heard in you. It said there came a sound from heaven. God is in charge, and God is creating the sound. You can jump as high as you want to jump, prophesy as much as you want to, figure it out as much as you want to, but when this thing comes, it's not going to be about you or your theology or what you think or your gifting. It's going to be about God making a sound from heaven, and there came a sound from heaven, and it filled the room, and a mighty rushing wind from heaven came, and Peter goes, what? That's what we're going to hear in this coming next move of God, all the prophetic, including me, are going to go like, how did I miss that? 
I didn't see that coming. Not that some of the other stuff wasn't right, but I missed the big one. Like, what was that? And I know it's true. We're picking up some stuff. I, I thought it was interesting just for me, I think, to me. I, Larry, you should have, you know, you're prophetic. You should have seen, you know, the 4.7 in New York City. I don't know anybody saw that. I thought we were prophetic. It was like, well, we get some stuff, we, some stuff we don't. But what's coming is going to be way beyond our prophetic bandwidth. It's going to be way beyond everything we've ever known prophetically. And by the way, here's what we can do. Like Elijah, we need to stubbornly intercede in a drought as Elijah did till he heard the sound of the abundance of rain. I've heard it. I heard it 37 years ago as the Lord stood in front of me. It's the most, one of the most amazing things. Twice he's come to me and preached to me. He's really good. Really. I mean, there's no way you can even start. Just, oh, my gosh. It was the most, just my, my hair on the back of my head for standing up. Like, Jesus, like, amazing. Five, I think this is the last one. Get ready for a protracted outpouring. This is not just another revival. This is the revival. This is not another move of God. This is the all things coming together, the culmination of generations and centuries and of purposes in God. It is not only a global impact, it's a generational impact. And your sons and your daughters on this planet will experience that. This is a super shift of all super shifts. The, the, the saints of old will be looking into desiring to be where we're at in this next thing that God's about to do. The first century church would trade places with us, I believe, if they understood what God is about to do with us. So what was it? Generational impact. There were prevailing, get this, there were prevailing waters. The waters prevailed in Noah's day for 150 days. That's Pentecost triple, 50, 50, 50. I like Acts 2, Pentecost. How'd you like to have three doses of Pentecost? Instead of lot, what? You go, what, what, what? It's like, my God, what is that? I mean, just as, just as a teeny tidbit in this last visitation I had, I just heard, I just screamed people saying, like, what is that? It's like, no context. Like, oh, my God, what is it? We've never seen anything like this. And I thought, God, thank you. Thank you for inviting this generation to at least see the beginning of one of the greatest moves of God other than the birth of Christ that ever happened on planet Earth. You believe that? You know, if I didn't, I, yes, I'd be, if I didn't, I'd be, I'd be done. I'd just go back home and play guitar. <laughs> Sorry, they watch air disasters. I like to watch air disasters. But anyway, don't, don't get me going there. But it's, it's always a little teeny. It's all, I love watching. I love watching. You ever seen the air the show? Every major catastrophic air disaster, when they finally get it through and go through stuff, it's usually one teeny, little teeny mistake that triggered a catastrophic event. Be careful. Be so careful. Watch, your, watch yourself and listen uh, the little, it's the little teeny things that matter. We have to really be in tune. Didn't mean to say that. But anyway, a protracted outpouring, Genesis 7. And I said it to you before, it's a widespread glory. Habakkuk 2.14 says, For there will come a day when the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. What a privileged people we are. What a privilege. We need to get our head out of the, out of the sand we need, we need to get what we need to get right. We need to set our house in order. That's what, that's what exactly Noah did. Not only did he set his house in order, he built an ark, and, 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 and he, was, he, he did it. He did it faithfully year after year when there looked like no results. I don't know about you, but I have not been that big a success the last number of years in the context of what we call successful. But the Lord said to me recently, you're not supposed to. Remember, you're Noah. Actually, they laughed at him after a while. But if you're faithful to do what God has called you to do, the end result will be worth 
the time that you spent being faithful to it. Prevailing waters. And it, I, I like this. All the, and this is in uh, Genesis 7, 17. All the high mountains were covered. Every high. That speaks of kingdoms. That speaks of the functioning of kingdoms and, and highs and lows and, and, and culture. Except every culture, every high mountain was covered by this outpouring. And I'll say it again because I can't say it enough. Every creeping, crawling thing in the earth died in this move of God. I'm in. I'm in for that. And there were three leases, uh, by the way, there were three releases of the dove. And uh, according to uh, Genesis. And I think I like this the most. And at the end of that, there was a rainbow, a sign of a covenant. Rainbow has how many colors? Do we know? Seven colors. Seven spirits of God. Isaiah 11. I mean, this thing's coming together like from every direction in Scripture. Old Testament, New Testament. And Genesis 9, 1, 4. Get this. And Noah was given complete dominion over all the earth. Did, did you get? And Noah, the house of God, walked away from that ark, and he ruled in God with complete dominion over every creeping thing and every crawly thing and everything on the earth because the kingdoms of our God have been designated to become the kingdoms of the Lord and his Christ. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Everything we've ever known up to now is wonderful, but it pales in comparison beyond belief of what is about to happen. We've got three years, and I have more hope than I've ever had in my life. I know it looks bad. I know there's a lot of pontificating about the worst is about to happen. Good. Let it do. It's, it's a biblical principle. When something bad happens, God goes, oh, that ain't going to work. I'll make something good three times better than that. You look through all from the book of Genesis to the crucifixion of Christ to the upper room to the apostles. And it's, I, I, like, I welcome, I say, if something really bad is happening, God's about to do something. Because that's like, I, cause when the enemy makes a move, God makes a super move on him. When the enemy said to Jesus, you know, you, you remember that? In the desert, and he's fasting, the enemy makes his move on the Lord. The Lord just made a super move on him. He said, get behind me, Satan. And, this, and, and he said, oh, you think this is something? I know I was hungry 40 days and 40 nights. Satan tempted him and said, look at you. Who are you? And it's, the scripture said this, and he came out of the wilderness, out of that temptation, out of that horrible time, filled with the power and the Spirit of God and began to do miracles and signs and wonders and heal the sick and proclaim the gospel. The worst of the worst is nothing but a platform for the best of the best to come. I am not afraid. Matter of fact, I welcome the worst of the worst because the best of the best can't happen until that happens. For when sin abounds, grace does much more abound. So yes, there's some bad stuff coming, but it's nothing but a sign that Grace and abounding grace is about to happen. Okay. What does that look like for me and you? I have no idea. Matter of fact, I would say you might want to put some plans on hold. I say you might want to put so well, I think God wants me to do this, or I think this is gonna I think you might want to just like like get off that for a little bit. And let this thing reveal itself. Everything God does doesn't have to be revealed by prophetic voices. Again, he is Jehovah's surprise, Jehovah's serendipitous, nearly everything he did in the Bible. A few things, prophetic people got it right, but they missed it by hundreds of years. I mean, prime example, Isaiah. What a prophet. He was right. He said, a virgin shall conceive. Gee, man, you should have. You should have said at least in the next millennium. 
because it was hundreds of years before his prophetic word came to pass. Can you imagine being Miss Isaiah living with him? Say, honey, that was a what? Shall what? And now he's old, ready to die, and he goes, well, that was a bad word. No, no, no. We don't, the pro, our problem is not that we don't have prophetic gifting. Our problem is timing. Because we live in a time and space world, and we try to overlap that into eternity that has no time or space. When God says suddenly, that can mean 10,000 years. So we've got to knock off all the timing stuff. It's got, got to knock it off. And we've got to, we've got to live in a, in a space of eternity, in a space where God lives, where there's no beginning or there's no ending of space. And God, where time is caught up into the amazing eternity that God has called us to live in. So, I just about emptied with my spiritual shovel all the stuff I thought I've known out about end times, about what's happening. And I've had to say, Lord, do it. Do it. Yeah. Just help me to build the ark in a way that will float. And by the way, isn't it interesting that the, there, was no, there was a door in the ark, which was Christ is that ark, out of his sight at Calvary, that ark. The animals came in. Creation came through the sight. It, it had such parallels. There was a door there. It was made out of cypress wood, which is cedar. It's a non-corruptible, non-corruptible wood, but the gospel is non-corruptible. It had three levels, body, soul, and spirit, or first, second, third, heaven. It only had one window, and that was at the top. So that the only way you could see what was happening, you had to look heavenward, and all you could see was the rain coming down. There was no room for vertical, horizontal vision. So we have to lift our heads up. We have to look upward for what's coming. And there was crazy stuff about the ark that so typically resembles Christ and the body of Christ, and I've gotten into that, not doing that this morning. There's tons of teaching on how that was put together and how it was made and what it was made with and of and et cetera. And uh, it, is, it is wonderful. And I'm going to end with this and say, on that third release of the dove, when the waters begin to evade in Genesis, there was a dove. And the dove is a type of the Holy Spirit. We know that. Three times Noah sends the dove out. First time he comes out, you know, comes back, you know, second time. And the third time it says he... He departs, and they don't see him anymore. That was in Genesis. Do you know the next time they saw the dove? Book of Matthew. And baptized by John the Baptist out of the water, that dove landed on Jesus' head thousands of years later. And you didn't get that. Let me say that again. (laughs) Jesus was a recipient of something that had age on it and thousands of years of, of time and space on it. We're about to, how can I say it? We're about to receive. We're about to receive. Something's about to fall on us that happened, that was pre-thought, that was preordained eons of ages ago. I don't think we're ready. I don't think we're worthy in that sense. But that's what I love about God. He does stuff like that. That's what he does for a living. He gets up every morning saying, how can I mess the church up? At least the part that don't know what I'm doing. How can I enlarge them? How can I, how can I shift them? How can I, how can I get their priorities? How can, I, how can I let them know? Well, one way, according to the book of Revelation, says, how will we know? When will it happen? When the bride hath made herself ready. And she says, come, Lord Jesus. So what's it going to look like this year, next year, the year after? I don't care. I don't care. I don't even want to weigh in on it. It doesn't matter because I'm probably going to be wrong. Anyway, uh, I I mean, I say I don't care. It's the wrong way to say it. I mean, it's irrelevant to me because we're living in a space where a lot of stuff is going to happen. It's amazing. But I can't focus on that. I got to focus on the end product, that it's going to rain and 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 rain 
until it's flood level and we were not able to swim in a religious stream we've been in before. And the kingdom of God is going to cover the earth in a way that we've never imagined. And you're going to be doing things you've never imagined. You're going to be seeing things you've never imagined. You're going to see the reshaping of culture and nations and, and people like you've never imagined before. God made this planet. He blessed this planet. He has plans for this planet. And he doesn't make those kind of architectural mistakes. He knows what he's doing. And this world belongs to him. We belong to him. And the end game is he wins. It is his. He will own it. And the Lord will come back and he will rule a thousand years on this planet, as the scripture says. And it's going to be an amazing. I don't think I'll probably be a part of that. If I am, that's fine. It doesn't matter. All I know is we're like blind men standing at the edge of sunlight, not knowing that our eyes are going to be open to something that is probably blinding to us. That's unprecedented. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for, uh, thank you for this time that we live in. Thank you for the days that we're in. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. You can't separate those two. Lord, thank you for rain. Let it rain, let it rain. Thank you for a flood from heaven that we cannot paddle against the current. We must go with the current. Thank you for an outpouring so unprecedented that nobody will ever be able to even determine or to define what it's going to look like. Because you are not the God of redo. You're the God of the new. For you said, behold, I shall do a new thing, not something that's already been done or not something that you understand or know. You take the light in that. Lord, I thank you. You take the light in surprising us. It's like Christmas in the spirit. We don't know what's under the tree. We just know there's a gift there, and you gave that gift who is Christ, and we're going to open that gift not knowing what's there other than our name is on that gift. The anticipation thrills me that it's something other than we've thought of or known or heard about or prophesied about or prayed about or envisioned or preached about because you are limitless. You are the God of brilliance. You are the God of all things. You are the God that's bigger than our little finite minds. You are the God that shows mysteries to us. You are the God that takes us from glory to glory, as Paul said. We are transformed into your image from glory to glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So let this glory fall. Let this glory fall. Let this rain come, Lord, in such a way, in such a wonderful way that we can truly dance in the rain during this season and not be discouraged, but be encouraged that although the worst of times are upon us, the best of the kingdom of God is descending at light speed toward us. Thank you for this super ship. Thank you for this place that we're in, Lord. Thank you for the redo of your church. Thank you for the touch of your spirit. Thank you for every culture, every nation, every person, every species that's going to be invited into this ark. Whether they come or not is their decision, their choice. But Lord, we build it to facilitate everyone. Everyone. We build it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Yeah. Did you play in Let It Rain? Oh, I know that song. Just do that. Go ahead, Rob. Let it rain. Just stand up with me. And by the way, if you need prayer that we have over here on the side, come to the side. We'll have some prayer people over here if you want. To. If you want to get wet, have them pray for you.
things are God when you don't know what to do. Usually when I know what to do, I figure, okay, that's not quite there. But when you don't know what to do in the presence of Almighty God, that's probably the best posture you can have. It's like, shoot, fire. That's pretty much it. Lord. But here's what I know that Elijah did during a drought. When it hadn't rained for many, 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 many long time. No rain. And he goes up to the top of the mountain and he gets on the ground in a birthing position and he's on his hands or, or on his feet rather standing on the ground with his knees up to his chin and he's in a birthing position and he prays he has a servant to go look go look and see has anything happened yet three times he sends him. and as he's birthing he's, and he's he's birthing in the spirit in intercession the servant comes back and say i see a little like a little just a little sign just a teeny like a man's hand, and he said, okay, get up. Let's get down the mountain. They're just going to rain. My point being, don't, you don't have to do it here. I'm not even asking you to do it here. But I think, I think we need to adopt the birthing position of Elijah. And that's called intercession. And as he put his knees uh, up to his chin, wrapped his arms with his hands, and he probably rocked back and forth as they would do in the Hebrew prayer. As he would rock, he, would, he interceded for this to come and for it to hurry to come for this great rain for the drought to be broken and I believe that when you go home today or tonight or tomorrow it would behoove us probably just in the secrecy of your own home the secrecy of your own place your prayer closet wherever you're at uh, it's just to just to get in the floor and get as low as you can get and and take a take a a, a birthing position uh, uh, like the baby has in the womb with the, 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 the knees up and the, the birthing position and pray as Elijah prayed. And you may not see much, but maybe a small hand, but our little thing, but that's just enough. And he broke the drought, Elijah did, before the Lord. He didn't have anything to do. He didn't have anything to say that mattered. It was his posture that mattered. So your posture will determine your prosperity, your posterity. Your posture is a very important. We got to get low. We got to get in an intercessory mood, we, a mode. We got to believe God. We have to. We have to not stop until we see some sign that this is coming. And it was said when it began to rain, God gave him Elijah strength to run, and he ran ahead of the horses down the mountain. I am so into this. I am so into this. I know I'm a male, but I'm trying to figure out how to birth. I, it's like, just like, I, I, it doesn't matter. I, I'm not ashamed. I don't care about it. It's like, whatever it takes, Lord, whatever. You know, I, I just, I, I want this so bad. And I know it's going to happen, too, but it, nothing really comes a full maturation without the witness of your saints. And without the, you, wait the, uh, you wait for the, you wait for the birthing. You wait for the partnership of your saints as you did with Israel at the Red Sea when all the people gathered at the edge of the sea then you opened the waters as they all began to cry out so take some time this week maybe sometime during the week and if you're embarrassed to do that in front of you know uh, anybody even your dog you know put them out of the room whatever just just get before the Lord in a birthing position and just begin to pray and ask God to open your heart and your eyes to what's coming and to help you to get ready for what's coming. Because what's coming according to the book of Revelation comes on this, on this caveat. The bride hath made herself ready. People say, when's this going to happen? When's Jesus coming? When? when the bride has made herself ready. He is not coming after an unkept, unmade, unready wife. He's coming after a glorious bride without spot or wrinkle who have humbled himself at the foot of the bride. <clears throat> that's us. So we need to get low. <clears throat> we need to re reconsider, recalibrate, uh, redo, rethink it, uh, reapply ourselves, recommit ourselves to the Lord in such a way that He can expedite this knowing 
chaotic time that is upon us for this great outpouring. So, Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus, Jesus' name. I know i got to quit, but I don't know why I don't want to. I think I want it to happen now. That's why. I, I was just like somebody throw a glass of water in the room or something. I don't know. I just, oh, I, I am so thirsty. I am so thirsty. I am so dehydrated. I am so thirsty. I'm thirsty, Lord, for another drink of your spirit.